Um, yeah, let's, let's get started. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Jana Renstrom. I'm the founder and president of the COTA Alliance, an organization for gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, and as we know, um, the United Nations has, uh, and all the countries of the world, have approved the um, Sustainable Development Goals. SDG number five actually connects with all the other uh, intersects with all the other goals, and uh, one of them being racial justice and equality. And that's why we're very proud to sponsor uh, Carol Neighbor and her new project, Black and Silence. And I'm happy to welcome you all for what's bound to be a very interesting discussion, which will take us forward. Uh, so welcome everybody, and Carol, um, over to you. Hi, thank you, Jana. I really appreciate you and Coda Alliance for partnering with me and the others for Black and Silence. And I want to welcome everyone to the official launch of Black and Silence. We've talked about it a bit online, but today is the official launch. So just some background, Black and Silence is a healing justice initiative, and I created it um, and to support the Say Her Name movement and actually in recognition of current um, calls to end systemic and structural racism. It's a campaign for us in a safe space as black women, for us cisgender and transgender included, for us to share our experiences, our story of trauma, abuse that has existed in our communities for years and centuries, and also to address the, the racism, the microaggressions, the discriminations that we've all faced or know someone that have faced it globally. Now I want to introduce my esteemed panel and ask them to briefly say something about themselves. The first one is Ms. Chanel Rose-Reed. Welcome, Chanel. Thank you, Carol. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, during the day, I am an external affairs manager for a local utility company. But in my free time, I am a strong advocate uh, to put a spotlight on systemic racism and to address uh, social injustices across this nation. So I am honored to be here and I'm ready to get started. Thank you. Thank you, Chanel. And the next person is Ms. Rosalind Page. And Rosalind is the founder of Black Femicide. I came across Rosalind's movement on Facebook, and I'm so impressed about the work that she's doing. But let me give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, Rosalind. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name, as she said, is Rosalind Page. I am a, I've been a nurse for over 30 years. I am the founder of Black Femicide US, and um, I'm so honored to be among the other panelists. You know, this is, you know, just, it's, it's a, a great honor for me. Um, as I stated, I've been a, a nurse for over 30 years. Uh, that's what I do by profession. But in my uh, spare time, I uh, actually uh, uh, record data regarding um, as many Black femicides across America that occur as I can. So that's, that's just a little bit of Thank you very much. The next person is Saiba Tumansare. Welcome, thank you for joining us. And I love your beautiful background in Sierra, of Sierra Leone where I am. <laughs> loving it, loving it. But please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about yourself. Great, um, I'm Saiba Tumansare. I'm originally from Sierra Leone. I've been living in the United States for the last 26 years. I served in the military for 23 years and did the last 10 years uh, of both military and public service at the White House. I recently resigned from the White House as the Assistant Director for Public Health um, to embark upon a journey of fighting maternal mortality crisis in Sierra Leone. Um, I've also launched, I just launched a podcast as well to draw and raise awareness, but also to highlight the work that, that needs to be done in Africa and that is already happening. And so I have a two-part journey uh, one focus on maternal mortality and the other to raise awareness about the challenges facing in Africa. I'm a physician assistant by trade. I've been a PA for 15 years now. Thank you very much, Saibatu. And last but not least is Dr. Estacy Colon-Porter. 
Welcome, welcome, welcome. I think we've known each other from what? Teenage, <laughs> high school. I mean, you have to be unmuted. But yeah, we've known each other a while. Yes. the other panelists. So I am Dr. Colon Porter. I'm a first generation uh, Garifuna American. Uh, my parents, I'm daughter of an immigrant. I proudly say that. I am an army veteran served for over 22 years with my career ending as uh I think we lost you, your voice, your sound. Can you, did you mute yourself by accident? Now we can't hear anything. And Carol, you're also muted. Okay. What happened? I had the fan on. That was the background noise. So I turned ah, it off. Okay. <laughs> so I turned it off. Okay, she's coming back now. Thank you. Oh, I am so Okay, you're fine. There you go. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't even know where I left off, but yeah, so I'm a veteran of over uh, 22 years, served 22 years, ending my career as chief of preventive medicine. I'm a nurse practitioner and with an extensive background in public health. I am um, a huge advocate of, um, you know, immigration reform, um, health, uh, addressing health disparities and a whole very, you know, just various topics. I'm also the founder, uh, president and founder of Jewel in His Eyes, which is an international nonprofit where we empower girls, women, nurses, um, and communities to be the healthiest version of themselves. Thank you very much. And now before we get started with our reflections and our questions, I do want to have a moment of silence for some of the women, cisgender and transgender women that have lost their lives to police brutality and other forms of violence. Breonna Taylor, 2020. Nina Pop, 2020. Tony McDade, 2020. Charlene Lyles, 2017. Karen Gaines, 2016. Sandra Bland, 2015. Alexia Christian, 2015. Maya Hall, 2015. Megan Hackaday, 2015. Janisha Fanville, 2015. Natasha McKenna, 2015. Tanisha Anderson, 2014. Ara Rosa, 2014. Shaniqua Proctor, 2014, Michelle Suzo, 2014, Pearlie Golden, 2014, Gabriella Neverez, 2014, Yvette Smith, 2014, Miriam Carey, 2013, Kime Livingston, 2013, Kayla Moore, 2013, Shelly Frey, 2012, Melissa Williams, 2012, Alicia Thomas, 2012, Chantel Davis, 2012, Charmel Edwards, 2012, Rakaya Boyd, 2012, Sharice Francis, 2012, Ayana Stanley Jones, 2010, and Latasha Harlins, 1991. And I wanted to start with those names because they're really some of the names um, that, that, that makes this journey worthwhile. My first experience with Say Her Name, contextually, it wasn't Say Her Name back then, was with Latasha Harlins in 1991. Latasha was 15 years old at the time. I'm trying not to get emotional because there's no way we should be reading the names of all these women that have lost their lives and just think about the families that they have left behind. But Latasha lost her life. She was 15 years old and she went into a grocery store in 1991. There were some um, words back and forth with the store owner uh, about whether or not she was going to pay for her item. And when she turned her back, the store owner shot her in the back of her head. 
she was found with the money. She had the money in her hand to pay. I believe it was a bottle of juice or a bottle of soda. And what makes this more tragic when we talk about Black Lives Matter and the, the calls to end systemic racism, Natasha's perpetrator, I won't name her because the focus isn't on her, but she received a community service and a $500 uh, fine for restitution, $500. Was that all Natasha's life was worth? And I recall, I was 20 years old at the time, and I remember hearing the story, and I thought to myself, that could be me. And as we read the names and countless names of individuals, women that we don't know their names, women that Rosalind features on Black Femicide, as we read those names, that could be any one of us. That could be any one of us. That could be any one of us. Systemic and structural racism has existed within Black communities across the world for centuries. It predates slavery, and then we can talk about slavery, the intergenerational and historical trauma that our families have experienced, and it didn't start today. We're all products of our environments. So when we talk about trauma and mental health issues within our communities, it didn't start today. Violence begets violence. So when we talk about violence, it's ingrained in our communities. When we talk about trauma, it's ingrained in our communities. When we talk about mental health issues and disorders, it's ingrained in our communities and our result of our experiences. I'm going to turn over the questions now to the panel. And my first question is to Chanel. Chanel, thank you again for joining us here today. Chanel has been very pivotal a backbone, one of two other people, Chanel and Robin. Robin couldn't join us today. That was, I, when I posed it to them, they said, we got your back. So I thank you and I thank you again for joining me today. Now, my question to you is, what are your thoughts on the current calls to end systemic racism and structural racism? What are your thoughts? First, I wanna say you're very welcome, but you already know that. Um, so my thoughts are, it's a start, right? It's it's 400 years later. I mean, you know, it's, it's 400 years behind, but I do appreciate the private corporations earmarking millions of dollars to bring attention to systemic racism and try to chip away at it. But until our government get involved in the movement, the needle will never change. We need universal universal support from our legislative system. We need to address systemic racism in the workplace, police department, housing, education, and most importantly, healthcare. So if the government cannot, if they cannot acknowledge systemic racism exists in this country, it would never change because you can't change what you don't acknowledge. And you in this situation is the American government. Thank you very much, Chanel, for sharing that with us. And I concur, the systemic change needs to happen. And it, you can find it in every nook and cranny of heterogeneous black communities across the globe. So thank you very much for that. My next question is to Rosalind. As I said earlier, I met Rosalind through her work online with Black Femicide. So Rosalind, I want you, my question is really, um, what inspires you to do the work? but I want you to really take us back to how this got started. So your question is three prongs. What inspired, how it got started? What inspires you to do this work? And how many women have you featured? Okay, um, uh, as I said, I've been a nurse for uh, a, a little over 30 years. I've, a lot of my uh, nursing work has been in uh, public health and, uh, and community awareness. Um, how I got started was I, you know, as, as a nurse, when patients come in, you know, you uh, give them questions like intake questions. I noticed that a lot of my black female patients, be they girls or women, uh, a lot of them had a history of sexual abuse, emotional and physical abuse. And then when uh, you start going further, 
a lot of them know or were close to whether it be family, friends, colleagues, what have you, who were victims of homicide. Um, about two years ago, uh, no, I'll go back further, about three years ago, a colleague of mine started a project and uh, she kind of uh, became like a mentor to me. She started a project and some of you might know of it called Women Count, where she uh, started documenting uh, women, you know, murders, murdered women. Um, and again, I appreciate her. She's a mentor, but she's, a, she's non-Black. I, I noticed that a lot of the victims uh, look like her. And that, that's not unusual for people to, you know, look in the mirror to see, you know, victims. So I decided at that time to start going back and doing a count of Black women and girls who were being murdered. And as uh, for me, I see it as twofold for Black women because not only does it come from systemic racism outside of the community, we also are impacted by misogyny within the community. So it's twofold for us. Um, and to date, as of today, there have um, I have recorded 888 Black women and girls that have been murdered today uh, through my independent research. Um, in totality, it's more than uh, 2,000. And that's um, probably closer to the 3,000 uh, earmark. And that's just for the last two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I would like to say is, um, I know that uh, the uh, FBI in 2016 stated that every 19 hours, uh, a woman is killed by her partner. But my estimates, my independent research, my spreadsheets, you know, I readily share them with people. My spreadsheets will say that that data is actually closer for Black women, 7.8 hours. So okay. either that number was kind of uh, skewed or, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how they came upon that. But as I stated right now, my data says for Black women is 7.8 hours. And we're also two times, uh, our murders are twice as much as Asian uh, and white women in this country. Wow, that's a lot of women. And I and, know- and the Carol, can I, can I piggyback off of that real quick, sure. going back to those uh, statistics? And yeah. I know in 2016, the Black and Missing Foundation, they gathered statistics for the FBI and in 2016 alone, not to go separate the, the killing, but let's talk about our, our women and people of color that's going missing. In 2016, there were over 240,000 people of color wow. that came up missing. And wow. of that, this, this is really was mind blowing, of that 240,000 uh, people of color that was missing, 37% of them were teenage girls under the age of 18. Wow. Yes, and, and that's just staggering. And unfortunately, you know, we don't get attention locally, nationally, or globally because we are Black, you know, because we're not a, a, a Holloway or, or Elizabeth Smart. So if they're not going to address it, it's up to us to address that. And I really want to put that out there. And that's why I started that, uh, the project that I'm doing too, because it's up to us to be a voice for the, uh, for voiceless Black women and girls, because no one honestly is going to do it except for us. Thank Absolutely. you, ladies. And for the other panelists, you're feel free to jump in uh, to piggyback off of the answers that um, that are being posed. And for the individuals that have joined us online, I thank you. And if you have a question or a comment, please put it in the chat room. And hopefully, we'll have time at the end so that we can um, ask your questions online. Now, I'm going to go over to Dr. Cologne Porter because what you guys have discussed, um, the statistics, the numbers are staggering. The names of some of the women that I have um, mentioned earlier, 
some of the women actually had encounters with police and they were suffering with mental health disorders. They were suffering with mental health disorders. There's a lot of healing that needs to take place within our community. Just like there's systemic racism, there's systemic trauma in our communities. When we talk about misogyny and different uh, forms of violence against women, we haven't even um, discussed sexual and gender-based violence and, and how many of us are victims of se uh, sexual and gender-based violence. So Dr. Cologne Porter, I wanna, I wanna turn this over to you. How do we address this? How do we address systemic racism, systemic violence, systemic trauma, and moreover, how do we heal? You're on mute. Uh, okay, sorry. So I, I wanted to um, kind of pitch Chanel had mentioned uh, the awareness and acknowledgement. So in order to heal from something, we have to recognize it. We have to acknowledge it. We have to bring it to surface. And what has happened that throughout the course of the years, so we have many studies out there, you know, it's called different, you know, names, but it is what it is, whether it's uh, race-based traumatic stress, you know, whether it's psychological trauma, their race incident-based trauma, at the end of the day is trauma. And it has to be acknowledged. It has to be acknowledged in order for us to heal and move forward. I, um, I'm always sharing, you know, with my audience or with the clients that I have that when we acknowledge, uh, when we when we acknowledge that pain and acknowledge that existence, then we can mourn through that, and then we can develop the steps and the strategies that we need to move forward with that. What has happened um, throughout, you know, the course, you know, of history is. We, we're a body of people across the African diaspora who have been oppressed, but yet we've been told that basically it, it, it never existed or it doesn't exist or get over it. You know, when those terms are shared with us or told to us, that is again, re-traumatizing that individual or re-traumatizing a, a group of people. And so we need to, again, as I mentioned, we need to recognize that it exists. We need to acknowledge it. We need to be able to mourn, to grieve through it. We need to be able to address um, the situations within, I say, within um, our own community, within our homes, okay? So uh, this topic can go on forever, but I, I also share it with the intergenerational trauma, right? So how do we heal from that? Well, we start at home, right? We start with that relationship. There are certain things that have been passed down yes. to us, yes. you know, from gener generation. You know, yes. when does this stop? How does it stop? How do, how do we stop it? Some people don't even know. There's something that they've been, you know, um, accustomed to and have passed it down to, this, to their children. So that's where we come in as advocates and, and raise that awareness. But it has to start in our home as well first. I always believe it has to start at home first. You know, so what does yes. that look like? Where I say it looks like in our parent, that parent to child relationship. Um, I, I wrote a book, you know, a few years back and it was co-authored with other women. It was called Step Into Your Healing. And my chapter mm -hmm. went into how I was sexually uh, molested, right? Okay. And um, I explained how I had to confront, you know, the person that did that. That's a part of kind of the inter intergenerational trauma. Um, I had to recognize it. I brought that up, you know, raised that awareness to that particular person. Um, in our generation, we don't like to talk about those things. We want to keep it hush, like it didn't exist right? It, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. If we can't fix at the home front mm -hmm. what is going on, 
then it becomes even a grander problem, um, if that makes sense. And as a community, I just believe that we, we need to walk together in that. You know, those that consider themselves allies you know, join us in that walk together with us, you know, don't oppress us, um, work with us, but not against us. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Cologne Porter. And it's so important that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we address trauma, the root of trauma. Let's look at the, the root of the trauma, because a lot of times, when you talk about the trauma that's been handed down to us, intergenerational trauma, trauma as uh, us as practitioners that, that deal with this, we know that trauma interrupts the development. It, 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 it interrupts the development, it affects the brain. So there's physiological as well as psychological effects of trauma. And when trauma occurs in our, within our communities and we're absorbing that trauma as kids, it's impacting us. Identity formation starts at a very young age. Who are we? And if we're surrounded by trauma, whether it's direct or indirect, it starts to become a part of us. One of the things that was very heart-wrenching to hear uh, when, is when people, that is heart-wrenching to hear is when people say about individuals that have been killed by the police, Oh, if they only obey the commands. Oh, if they only did this. Individuals have trauma responses. It's yes. in, in, embedded in their brains, embedded in their psyche. And when we can't fault the victim because you don't know how, what they have, what their experience is, what they've been ex exposed to. And I particularly look at Sandra Bland's um, situation when she lost her life and people were blaming her for taking her life. No one knows for sure. Her family said she did have some depression. She got over it. But again, us as, tra as uh, practitioners, we know that people are triggered. People are triggered. There are trauma triggers, there are memories, PTSD occurs, and there's also comorbid um, depression, anxiety, psychosis that happens with individuals that have experienced trauma. So when we're looking at, at trauma from a systemic standpoint, when we look at the systemic racism, we have to deal with the effects. We have to deal with the effects. I'm gonna to get to you, Saiba too, but I wanna introduce Natasha Warner and bring Natasha on because Natasha is, is an advocate in her own right. She's also my soror, the best sorority in the world, Delta Sigma Theta. <laughs> But I want to bring you on, unmute your mic, and just tell us a bit about yourself, Natasha, and your thoughts so far on the conversation, and 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 um, what are you doing? Uh, thank you for having me, and I apologize for being late. You know, no working from home, being a virtual uh, school mom, all that good stuff. Um, yeah. But so, based on what I've heard so far, and just you know, the the topic, you know, breaking the silence, and this is a very important conversation. Um, it's also important to me because I am, I've just recently enrolled to become a licensed professional mental health counselor. Yes. We, need more, and we need more people, women of color, men of color. So the men out there, um, I see my good friend, Kevin, I see Keith on the line. So I'm glad to see that the men are stepping up. Um, but this, this is important. This conversation is so vital to our community. I heard Dr. Porter mention something that, you know, in an African-American community, this is not done. So I applaud you ladies um, and gentlemen for being here. We need to have more of these courageous conversations. Um, it, it's needed and it's, it's, it's good because there are, are advocates in, the, in, this, in this space right now who are talking about mental health and it's important that we take, we break the stigma. Like we stop that, we stop the notion that mental health or that person's crazy or, yes. you know, I, I even, I, I mean, you mentioned that I'm an advocate. So I go on my Facebook page and I use my social media platform to, mm -hmm. to advocate for, yes, I saw a therapist last year. Um, mm -hmm. I had a, a, a horrific situation that happened. I was actually at Keith's house when it occurred. Uh, my mm -hmm. son's almost drowned, both they're now nine and 10, but mm -hmm. my son's almost drowned and you know, that same night, a friend of mine invited me to a party and I text her and I said, girl, I can't make it. The boys almost drowned. I mean, I'm just shaking. And she said, I'll just come on over and get a drink and you'll be all right. Yes. And it was, it was, it was not that it was 
something sensitive of her because she's a very dear friend of me and she loves the boys if they're her own you know sons or you know nephews etc but mm -hmm. I think people don't realize how how traumatic yes. <laughs> trauma can be yes and so for me you know the the way in which I could look at it is like oh you know they didn't you know the positive mind you know a reframing is oh nothing happened mm -hmm. they, they they made it out uh, mm -hmm. but the the part of me is I had to deal with the anxiety and the yes. The, the stress and just the thoughts that were, were going mm -hmm. through my head. Um, so trauma can look like anything. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that occurred or it's just something that you survived. But it took me a year. It took me going to see a therapist to realize and recognize that every day, this is what I said I was gonna tell my patients once I've become licensed is that um, I, I, had a, I had surgery last year. My left kidney was removed. So I talk about that on my, my page. That was traumatic of uh, finding out that I had kidney cancer or what have you. Uh, but what I, thought, what I thought about is, and this is what helped me get through my incident with the boys is, think about the day that like, you had the surgery, you had this you know, horrific surgery, you're in so much pain. Mm -hmm. And you know, the next day, how'd you feel the next day? Okay, I was still in pain, but it started easing. And then after like a month, oh, oh, you know, now I'm back to twerking and doing my thing. I'm, I'm back to, <laughs> to, to being who I wanna be on my Peloton, but it took all that time to heal. And so yeah, that's yeah. the same thing, you know, it, it, it's very, very, very painful in the beginning, but each day, hopefully it gets better with work, with discussion, with talks like this. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just thankful you all, you all are having this conversation. I'm thankful to Thank be you. here. I'm going to sit back and listen and, and, okay. and take all this knowledge and expertise in. You all rock, you know, and I wore my earrings for Carol. Ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> He's the land. But um, yeah, yeah I, I appreciate you all for having me on this conversation. I want to continue to see more like this take place. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Natasha. And now I'm going to turn it over to Saiba too. I was going to chime in first on um, sure. Natasha's uh, point. Um, sure. And this is something that Dr. Dr. Labor and I have spoken about, spoken a lot about. In our community in Africa, it, well, let, let me talk about Sierra Leone so I don't overgeneralize here. In Sierra mm -hmm. Leone, we lack the infrastructure for mental health. And so when people go through things, you expect it to just be strong and kind of go through it, right? And, and one of the ways that her and I connected, I lost my father last year. And I'm grateful that I was in the United States when, when that happened to a degree because the support system is a little different than in Sierra Leone. We have a community support system, you know, family members will come over, but the mental health aspect itself, like there would, I would not have been able to go sit with a counselor and talk through what I went through. Now, I must also say, I still didn't do that here in the United States. I kind of turned to my faith instead, but it's because my upbringing didn't even, I, you know, I'm not used to it. I'm not used to going to talk about my problems, right? If something is wrong, if I experience some sort of trauma, you're supposed to be tough and you just work through it. Um, mm -hmm. And we, as, as, as black women, we're very notorious for having that strong look and, 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 and even the men, right? We want to represent strength, um, especially when we have children, right? So even when I was grieving my father, I tried to like separate my, my kids from that because I didn't want them to see their mother in that weak state, call it that, even though that's not what that is. But mm -hmm. I quickly learned that how do I teach them talking about the intergenerational problems, right? If I don't teach them now how to deal with these things, then they grow up themselves thinking I need to just power through. And you may not necessarily have all the skills to be able to power through certain bad things in, in your life. And so I I'm grateful your, 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 your conversation really kind of sparked what we definitely need in the country that, I, that I'm heading back to uh, because we just lack that support system whatsoever. It's just family coming together to talk through it. So uh, Dr. Dr. Lay, we're back over to you to keep it. <laughs> Sorry, I had to digress there for a second. <laughs> Not a problem. And thank you because we, we've talked about systemic racism in the context of police brutality, police killings. Um, we've talked about femicide, um, misogyny, but there's also other areas that we need to address, right? such as the criminal justice system, the school, the school systems, the, the health system, hospitals, and even maternal mortality rates. It's systemic. It impacts Black women at a higher rate than any other women in the world. So um, my question to you, Saibatu, is... What's, how important are our allies? I know Chanel uh, touched on it, but how important are our allies? And then tell us more about the work that you're doing in the area 
of maternal mortality and addressing that because systemic is it's 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 the root of the issue. And like a tree, there's branches, it goes different ways and it impacts our communities. And we, we cannot sit back and say, oh no, not me, not us, not our child. I'm a mother of three black boys. I'm currently in Sierra Leone. I, every morning when I wake up, I think about my boys. Before I go to sleep, I think about my sons because they're all taller than me now. They're all at least six foot tall. So, and, and it's, it's, in, it's embedded in our, in our communities, in our psyche, and we cannot separate ourselves and say, no, not me, no, not us. Because in the world, the world is, a, in a, everyone intersects. So at some point, we, us, you, them, we're gonna intersect. And how do we heal? How do we address our trauma? Saibatu, when you talk about showing up in the, um, what was that? Yeah, you, as strong and black, black, strong black women, how many of us are dealing with issues? Then we show up in the workplace. Oh yeah, all put together. Yes, <laughs> and we have to be put together or we're perceived as angry. She's an angry black woman. No, maybe I just got my behind beat by my husband before I got to work. You know, we're, it's like in the spaces when we talk, Chanel talked about uh, systemic racism in a, in a corporate world. It exists because we're not allowed to show up and be strong. We, 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 we're allowed to, it's still in some situations that yes, massa, no massa, and because how dare you black girl speak up for yourself? How dare you black man speak up for yourself? And then they'll, people do, do when we talk about microaggressions, oh, you're different. You're not like them. Oh, I am them. Yeah. Or, I mean, I even get when people actually see me, they'll hear my voice and I get, oh, you're Carol? Or I'll get, you're African? Yes, I'm African, I'm Carol. I don't know if people don't expect me to show up with this big Afro like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> but we show up and we have to heal within our communities and give us our right to show up and show out. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and tell us how important our allies are. Yeah. We, um, before we started, Jana from Coda Alliance spoke and I wanna give a, 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 a great thank you to Ann Haddock from Counterpart and International. She's one of the financial sponsors. These two women are my allies in this. I'm hoping to get more, but they're my allies. I called John. I met her at the, at the UN while I was there doing some work, advocating. Hadn't spoken to her in almost five years. When this came up, I called her. She was like, sure. No hesitation. She didn't say, oh, no, I don't want to get my organization involved in that. She said, sure. And did the same thing. Sure. So, side by two, I'll turn it over to you and tell us the importance of having allies. I may uh, go off on a tangent there for a little bit. I get very passionate about things. Okay. So bear with me here. But I think that's a very good question. I think it's an important one uh, that we all need to embrace as we navigate what now seems to be a very chaotic world. From a personal standpoint, and, and almost similar to what you just said, without allies and champions and cheerleaders, I would not be sitting here among all of these esteemed and extremely brilliant women. Um, somebody saw something in me, somebody continues to see something in me, and they continue to invest in being a partner and an ally with me. But I, I'm, I'm going to move away from the personal perspective and look at it from a people perspective. What is an ally, right? right. An ally is, is somebody who's going to join us, uh, join with one another to accomplish something. Teaming up does not mean that I am weak. It just means that together, our superpowers are able to impact change. You're not helping the disadvantaged Saibatsu. That's not what you're coming to do as an ally. But what it does mean is that we together, we see a problem. We also together see a solution and we all bring something different to the table to affect that change. It should be a mutually beneficial relationship, right? This is not about me looking up to you to fix what I am very passionate about that I think needs, uh, needs some kind of unity or collaboration. It's something that we're working on together. Now, Aristotle has this, I had to write this part down, but Aristotle has a profound um, um, uh, 
but one of the very intelligent things that he said, one of them is very profound as it relates to this, and it's the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So in other words, when we connect our individual parts to become one, we are worth more than our individual parts in silos. So if I, if my, my, my example of maternal mortality, by myself, I will never be able to reduce the numbers of deaths in Sierra Leone. It's impossible. I need everybody to come together. I need allies. When we band together, we are redefining what normal is and what is acceptable. We represent a unified message. So they know there's a lot of people saying the same exact thing. And we're in this together. And we want to have a unified approach to impacting change. I'm certain we've all been part of an alliance or, or seen an alliance, and it comes in different forms. There are people that are very outwardly with their alliance, right? They're going to make sure you know that they're leading the charge or they are very vocal about that topic. And then there are the others that are behind the scenes. They lay low, but they're impacting change. Quite honestly, I think we need we need both. We need some people to, to, to scream from the mountaintops, and we need others that are working behind the scenes. But but, but as allies, we have to understand the experience or struggles of others. We have to listen to each other. We have to truly be free of judgments or assumptions. You can't look at me in my hijab and automatically assume that I'm just, I'm a Muslim and there's something wrong with me. I am a Muslim, let me, not, let me correct that part. I am a Muslim, but but doesn't mean that I'm a terrorist. Doesn't mean that I'm an extremist, right? I'm a woman of faith and I'm embracing my faith inwardly and outwardly and I wore my hijab and I went to the White House every day and they could, you know, you could take it or leave it. That's just what was coming. Um, well, I can't emphasize the need for mutual respect and trust when yes. we're working together as allies, right? My situation, you may not quite, it may not seem as dire to you. And it goes back to Natasha's story about her, her, her sons and her friend thinking it's okay, just, you know, not necessarily get over it, but I need you to understand that I'm in a place and I need you to respect that. And it may not make sense to you, but you don't know where I came from to why this is such an impactful moment for me. Yes. And sometimes as allies, we have to come out of our comfort zones to be partner in impact and change. It's not going to be the way, it's not a cookie cutter thing that, you know, I'm just gonna follow the guidelines and, and go along with it. Some of the conversations are uncomfortable, but we have to band together because if it's uncomfortable for you to hear it, imagine me that's going through it, right? What I'm right. feeling. So I need you to just, you know, kind of band with me. If you're gonna be an ally, I need you to band with me. Allies walk beside us, right? They amplify our efforts. They unite our voices to support change and structural norms, but they don't lead, they don't take over our process. They're just beside us as Kota is doing with you right now, uh, um, Dr. Labor. This is your platform. They are walking alongside you to unite your voice and your efforts. They, you know, our identity concerns because of their position. We, they're not doing it because of their position of power. If you're an ally, you, or, or because you're morally obligated to, I must donate this because it's just the right thing to do. No, we do this as an ally because we yes. actually want to impact change. And, and then there's so much, there's the multi-ethnic stuff, there's the multi-issue alliances, all of that. But if we want long lasting, sustainable impact and equitable future, we have to align. There's so much that we need to do, but yet most of us are pretty much oblivious to it. Or we're waiting for someone else to start the conversation or we keep turning a blind eye to it because it doesn't affect us directly. So I'm just gonna stay in my corner and I'm gonna watch it all play out. Here we are today talking about racial issues today and, and kudos to Kota, kudos to, to Dr. Labor for putting this on, for uniting our voices, for amplifying efforts, for having us all here today to literally discuss tragedy. I'm a mother of three, just like you, Dr. Labor. I, ha I have two sons and, and a daughter, but my oldest son is, is who I worry about. My oldest son is 20, he's in college. He's a young black man, probably mm -hmm. expense when I'm not around. I'm yeah. sure he, had, and he has crazy hair, just like every other young man running around. He drives, I'm sure he doesn't wear a seatbelt all the time. And he probably listens to his music a tad bit louder than the rest of us that are sitting here. He doesn't yeah. do drugs, he doesn't drink. He's a kid in college, but not a day goes by that I'm not worried about my son. Because all it takes is for him to be at the right place, but at the wrong time, right? Yes. This is the yes. world. Yeah, so, sorry. I said I was gonna go on a rant here, my bad. No, it's okay, it's okay. This is it's the okay because we feel it. We feel yeah. it as, as and, and just for um, correction, I'm a mother of four, I have a daughter. Oh, okay, but I really, okay. Yeah, yeah, I worry about the boys more, yeah. Yeah, but uh -huh. this is the world we live in today. And this, this is yes. not just America, the world is chaotic. 
And, and as I continue to talk about my rant, we just need more allies, more yes. unity, more collaboration, more mm -hmm. fight for change, because not only are we looking at at racial issues, they're human rights issues, right? Yes. Whether it's religious issues, there are yes. 1 million Chinese Muslims who have been in a Chinese government ran detention center since 2017 because mm -hmm. they are seen as a threat to security. Christians in North Korea are being seen as hostile elements and they're being deported to labor camps or killed on the spot. Now that's just mm -hmm. two examples of faith, right? There are many more Christians and Jews and Muslims yeah. are persecuted for their faith. We have ethnic issues, we have gender issues, where yes. women don't have a say on their bodies when they want to have a child, when they want to get married. We are treated differently than men. We're, there was, a, you know, for a while there, we, we heard all the, the talk about, you know, men getting paid more than women. And I don't know where the conversation kind of went with there, but we also yeah. have health issues dying it now to yeah. my maternal mortality. There are 830 women dying every single day from the complications of childbirth. 300,000 women a year. This is 2020. 300,000 mm -hmm. women a year are dying from the complications of childbirth. This yeah. is unacceptable, right? So, so we need allies. We need to do more. We need yeah. more discussions and unity and collabor collaborative opportunities and mm -hmm. allies like COTA to impact societal change. Now, yeah. Dr. Labor, I've gone on a rant, so I'm going to give it back to you. Thank you so much. I hope I answered the question correctly. But these <laughs> They're just one of a million issues out there, but because it doesn't affect me, we, we kind of look the other way and we, and we, and mm -hmm. we have to stop. And, and I'm part of this with you. And, and I, you. I must say, this is something that I'm not all the way familiar with, but I said, nope, I'm going to align. I'm going to, I'm going to do my homework and I'm going to figure you. it all out because I focus on the health sector piece a lot more, but mm -hmm. I have a son, right. And, 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 yeah. and it will affect me because Trayvon Martin would, happened to be a baby at the wrong you know, time right so one of them yeah. and to that point the other day like i said i'm i'm currently in sierra leone and on saturday my baby he'll be 16 soon he said he was at the outlet mall with their father and i said where'd you get he says some sneakers and a hoodie when i heard when i heard the word hoodie mm -hmm. i'm I, in in my in my mind i'm like you can't wear a hoodie, but I don't want to scare this baby. But it's something, it's a, it's a trigger. When we hear these things, hoodies, yeah. our children aren't allowed to wear hoodies, play with toy guns, cowboys and robbers. I mean, it's, 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 when we talk about trauma and what this has done to us as a community, heterogeneous communities, because all black communities aren't the same. Saiba Tu and, our, and I are, are, are from Sierra Leone. You have Garifona, you have our black Americans, you have Caribbean Americans, Jamaican Americans, Chinese Americans, I mean, Chinese blacks. And, and you have so many diverse communities of color, black women that are dealing with these issues. And so I thank you guys so much. And now I want to turn it over. If we have any questions yeah. for the yeah, um, for the panel, I want to go back. Okay. Yeah, I just to want to go back. I want you to me. say something as well. Thank you for joining. After Chanel, Keith, let's give you the floor. Oh, ahead, yes, so I just want to say real quickly. I want to go back to allies. You know, mm -hmm. allies are important, but what's more important is making sure you have a diverse ally. You know, just like a strength in numbers, yes. it's even more strength in diversity. Because when you have a diverse coalition, it just opens the door for a larger platform, communities yes. and cultures. You know, you got to have that rainbow coalition, right? You want to add as many colors mm. as possible to make it more vibrant and vivid. And it's mm -hmm. there to help your cause. So, you know, allies are important, but, but diversity is even more important. I just wanted to add that. Like Thank that. you. And just to piggyback off of that, funding. Funding is so important to us. Well, that goes without the saying, work, absolutely. The work that we do, I, and it's just my experience that so many of us are doing this work is volunteer work. And even here now, I'm in Sierra Leone and there are um, people here, there are expats here doing tremendous work. 
But then there are also some expats here just on the beach every day. And we're volunteering our, 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 our heads off to in different causes. So having allies is good. And having allies that are helping us to get funding is better. Um, Keith, can you join us and say a few words, questions, comments? You're muted. All right, here we go. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hey. Right, cool. I, I, I'm like Sabatu. I can go on a rant myself, but um, yeah. I, I was driving, so I didn't have my video on, but I heard everything you ladies were saying. Um, yeah. Carol, I miss you. And, I miss uh, you too. <laughs> uh, you know, you are, you ladies already know you have, you have an ally in me, but yeah. um, I, I heard something you all were saying in regards to systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And I think Chanel had um, said it very clearly. Uh, we have a president here that doesn't think that there's any such thing as systemic racism in this country. I mean, with all the examples that have been given across the world, there's no such thing as systemic racism. And just like alcoholism, until you admit you have a problem, you cannot defeat that problem. You cannot even begin to attack that problem. You have to admit that there's a problem first. Once you admit that there's a problem, then you work towards a solution. The other thing is, as black people, we have to be willing to put the work in. When we put out a boycott for a particular store or a particular vendor and we don't boycott or we don't show our economic power, yes. all, we're doing is, all we're doing is giving the floor back to them. I mean, so we have to also put the work in and we have to be willing to sacrifice in order to put, you know, in order for the greater good. So yes. we'll leave it at that. Thank Thanks. you for sharing that, bro. I really appreciate it. Any other questions, comments from the other participants? Yeah, I wanted to say, you know, thank you, Keith, for being and thank you for being an ally. And it's so important. You know, I'm always having um, heated discussions, you know, with my husband, <laughs> you know, about, um, just the need for our Black brothers. And I'm going to say that our Black brothers mm -hmm. to be there for us mm -hmm. when our Black women are being killed or being mm -hmm. harassed, you know, to step up. I feel that that's like a missing piece or rather, let me just say, um, when I see in the media as recent as what, you know, uh, what occurred with George Floyd, right? Mm -hmm. There was this, the massive movement that happened behind that, you know, women, of course, we're gonna show up and show out. Our black mm -hmm. brothers came together. This was a whole global thing that happened. And then in the midst of that, Breonna Taylor, and I'm like, where's my black brothers? Yeah. You know, where yeah. are they? And okay. so that's, so, so I, I, I you know, uh, Dr. Yes. Lewis, okay, I want to ask Keith, you know, what, um, how do, how do, what do you see or what needs to be done to mobilize our black brothers when it comes to that, to be allies for us black women? Mm. I would say, uh, more of a brotherhood. I mean, we, we, we as yeah. black men have to learn to love ourselves first yeah. and then we can love each other. Once we, once we learn to love each other and stop gritting at everybody and, 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 and being aggressive at, at each other, then we can start to love you all. But we, we, we first have to learn to love ourselves. I see so many uh, young men um, raised in, in single parent households by a female yeah. and you know, these, these brothers need to come back to their sons, you know. Yes. And I understand the daughters need, I understand the daughters need their fathers too. But in this day and age, in this country, the young brothers need their fathers. And yes. until we can come together and mm -hmm. and learn to love ourselves, we can't love you. We can't even love our own women, so that we can protect our women because we're mm -hmm. too busy battling each other, you know. So yes. until we learn to come together as one and and, and have a, a true brotherhood then we can protect our women. And, and to, to your point, Keith, when we, call, when, we, when, we, when we call on our brothers to protect us, we also want to call on our brothers that are in positions of power to protect us as well. When we talk about systemic racism, violence against each other in Black communities is systemic. It's systemic, it's historic. I mean, if you take it in a context of slavery, the slave masters, they beat the black men, 
They rape black women in front of their men. So this trauma, this violence that exists within our communities, within the hood, as, so, as people like to say, it's intergenerational and it, it was learned. It's like a baby, when a baby is learning how to walk. They You're right, Carolyn. The other thing, we, we, had a, we had a young brother shot and killed yesterday in West Philadelphia. Yes, I saw first, that. First thing you saw was his mother run to his rescue. Yes. You know, and that's reminiscent of mm -hmm. during slavery when the black male was being pulled away from the family yes. and sold off to another plantation. The yes. mother. So when a black man gets into trouble, mm -hmm. the black woman, the mother is always there. That's not my yes. son. My son wouldn't do that. Always there protecting. And this mm -hmm. is this is this is definitely remnant. This is a these are remnants of slavery where yes. the black woman has seen her son pulled away to get sold off to another plantation. Mm -hmm. We are reliving this, but in a different dimension. We really are. Yeah, we're living in a different dimension, but it's up to us to bring the focus to the healing part, the healing justice. We talk about justice, justice for this, justice for that, and in systemic racism, but that also has a, um, a healing aspect to it as well. Now, we have run out of time. We have no. talked for an entire hour. Um, we'll definitely do this again because this isn't a one-off conversation. Healing starts with us and in, in educating individuals about the effects, psychological and physiological effects of trauma, how it impacts the development, how it impacts the brains of our children and their witnessing these murders on television, they're witnessing uh, riots, they're witnessing um, um, rhetoric against black communities, it impacts their development. So it's, it's up to us collectively to promote healing justice within our communities. And that's exactly what we're going to do with Black in Silence. And I really appreciate all of you guys for joining me today, my panelists, Saiba Tumansare, Chanel Rose Reed, Rosalind Page, Dr. Stacy Cologne Porter, and Natasha Warner for jumping in there. I appreciate it. And Keith, brother, you know I always do. Thank you again to Coda Alliance and Jana and Ann for all the planning. And as well as Ann Haddock and Counterpart in, and Counterpart International for their financial sponsorship. The journey continues. Have a good evening, everyone. Well, it's evening here in, in, in Africa. It's five and don't forget, the vote. don't forget the vote. Don't forget the vote. Don't forget the vote. Yes. 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 Please vote. Don't forget, don't forget to vote. Have yes. have a good evening, guys. Bye. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Ann. Bye-bye.